Hi, everybody. It's such a pleasure to welcome you to the February edition of Living Histories, opening with Eleni Katifori. So glad and so excited to hear your story. Eleni, please tell us about Living History. So thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Um, I am really honored to be part of this group, but I also have to say that I saw some uh, people that I see every day, a couple of people that I see every day in the audience, and I'm very embarrassed because I was going to tell you some things and then I think, okay, they're going to forget about them. But now I, you know, I see my colleagues every day. Um, okay, so uh, since this is living histories, let me start with the beginning. Uh, I was born in a country very, very far away, which is called Greece. And um, especially, I was born in Athens, which is a kind of a boring place, right, uh, over here. And let me zoom in a little bit more and show you something that you're very likely to know about Athens, and that is the Parthenon. This is uh, to Athens what the Eiffel Tower is to Paris. Uh, and also I'm going to show you something that there is absolutely uh, no way you know, and that is my high school. So I went to a kind of uh, regular, I would say, high school. It wasn't any private or fancy high school. Um, uh, it was uh, it was a magnet. It was supposed to be a magnet magnet school, but there was really nothing particularly magnet about it. Um, uh, but it, because you know the students were selected by lottery, so yeah, I was I went to that high school. Now it was a quite interesting place because while we were deciding uh, where to apply, let's say for college, and in Greece at the time, uh, you and it's still the case, you do not apply to a university; you apply to a department specifically. It's like Germany, so you have to know since you are basically 16 years old, what you want to do with your life. So since this was a regular high school, I did not have any good, uh, let's say, um, information about what I should be doing in my life. And I did not know what engineers were doing. For example, I thought engineers uh, were learning how to design cars, and I had no interest in that. Although in retrospect, now I think I would be quite interested in engineering. So I crossed it that completely out of uh, uh, my list. I wanted to be a mathematician, but I also knew that uh, since a very young age that you need to have a very specific personality to be a mathematician, and I did not have that. So if you cross out everything else in STEM, you end up with, uh, with physics. Now, a place that played a really big role in my... Um, uh, maybe indirectly in my decision to do physics was a relatively small island on the west part of Greece, which is where my family originally comes from. And I'm going to show you this picture to brag because it's absolutely beautiful. This is like the beach next to the village where my family is, is, is from. And I had the huge advantage that every summer they did not send me to camps. I had no structured time since I was a kid, since I was in um, elementary school. There were no camps, there was nothing. So I had a lot of free time where I would go to the beach and I would swim. And I also could read, would read. And there were all these pop science books. And I had a lot of time to read because there was absolutely nothing to do. So I got interested in physics. So after this, uh, kind of re relatively interesting, but also very boring years. I went to college to a, uh, the University of Athens. And I'm sorry, I don't have more pictures of the people there that uh, influenced, uh, let's say, my trajectory and all that. Uh, the reason is I have analog pictures and that says a lot about my, my age. At the time it was still uh, digital cameras were not super popular. And everything is uh, back in my, uh, you know, family home in Athens. And I didn't have anything to scan and put in the presentation. So it's only stuff I could find online. So I went to the University of Athens, the physics department. And here you see a picture of the building. It's a very, very profoundly ugly building. But I had the privilege of having some very 
uh, good teachers. Uh, so the system there is again very unlike uh, the United States one. Basically, you are sent to college and there is, you don't have that much supervision in a way. If you don't want to go to class, you don't go to class. You fail the class, nobody cares, right? So you have to manage yourself. But the resources are there. If you care to talk to people, the resources are there. So I was very lucky with that. Um, so during, um, let's say, my undergraduate, after about a couple of years, I realized that I really want to do statistical physics and not particles, particle physics, as it's very fashionable in Greece for people to go into particle physics. Um, but somehow it didn't appeal to me. So I applied to grad school uh, when I was done with undergrad. And uh, I got accepted to a few schools and I knew I wanted to do statistical physics. So I decided to go to Boston um, and this distinguished institution and do a PhD in physics. And I was very lucky that David Nelson, uh, some of you might know, uh, accepted, although I did not know anything and I still don't know anything, he accepted me uh, in, his, uh, in his group. Uh, and I, it was, I was very, very lucky. And I was, I was, where I was not lucky is that my, let's say the first project that I did in the first, let's say three or four years was vortices in planar superconductors. And at the time I didn't realize it myself, but I had absolutely no interest in vortices in planar superconductors. Uh, my advisor, David Nelson chose this project because the first thing I told him when I went to his office to talk to him was that I do not know exactly what I want to do in, uh, in physics, but I know I don't want to do biophysics. Uh, I said that. It came out of my mouth. Um, because I did not know exactly what biophysicists did. Again, the, the ignorance that has been chasing me uh, my entire life. Now, I was not enjoying it at all. And in fact, I had hit a dead end. And um, at around the time 2003 and 2006, where all this was going on, I had a lot of my classmates basically leaving grad school and going to Wall Street. Remember, this was pre-2008 pre and making a ton of money and you know, driving fast cars and you know, living the life. And I was there in a project that I didn't really, I wasn't really passionate about. So it was quite an interesting time. Uh, towards the end of my PhD though, uh, I was very, very lucky because uh, my advisor suggested I do a project, uh, a different project, a second project, let's say, to complete my PhD. And I absolutely fell in love with that. And that project had to do with the mechanics uh, of pollen grains. So it was still uh, soft matter, let's say. It had nothing to do with vortices in superconductors. Uh, so this project was in close collaboration with an experimentalist uh, at the uh, one of the biology departments at Harvard at the time, Zach Dumay. And I won't tell you much about the project. I will just tell you that I fell in love completely and absolutely fell in love with plants. Um, uh, to the point that I also did some experiments myself. Uh, I was a terrible experimentalist, but I appreciated tremendously how hard it is to do good experiments. Uh, but again, it was a lot of fun. So in that project, basically, we studied the mechanical deformations of, uh, of pollen grains. So after my PhD, I went uh, to uh, south to New York, to Rockefeller University, uh, where I had an independent fellowship. In fact, I lived in this building on the 18th floor, the building that you see there. Uh, it was, I was living the life right in New York in a high, on a high rise, right? You, it can't be better than that. Um, so one of my mentors, uh, I would say my main mentor was Marcelo Magnasco. And I chose this picture of him because he really looks fierce here. So I think he would like this picture. And uh, we started working together because one day he came into my office and he said, I know you like, you like plants a lot and I like networks. So why don't we work in leaves? And I, again, this was another subject I fell in love with, and I'm still working in these topics today, right, since uh, my, my postdoc. Um, so we studied the structure and function of leaf venation, and 
uh, we were taking these like cool movies uh, that show uh, how the uh, venation of the leaf uh, allows, uh, you know, the leaf to have certain functions. We were doing optimizations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It was a lot of fun. Now, after my uh, postdoc at Rockefeller University, I crossed the Atlantic once more and I went to Göttingen, uh, which is a beautiful city uh, in uh, the middle of Germany. And I was an independent group leader at the Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization. These are some of my uh, group, uh, group members. So this was a fantastic city and the Institute was uh, fantastic, but it was um, a little bit uh, problematic because uh, in the end, because I made the mistake of having a baby in Germany. And at the time it was absolutely impossible to find daycare before the age of one. And in fact, I've learned the term that they had in Germany for women that decide to work and have a baby. And that is Ravensmutter, Raven's mother. So it was very, very hard for this uh, because it was, there was no support really. Uh, and yeah, nevertheless, it was, uh, it was a great time, but I had started missing the US. Uh, in this picture here, by the way, I am dressed as a minor because I was visiting Goslar and we had uh, like a special tour where they were, uh, Goslar is a, um, uh, the oldest and the longest running mine in the world, it was running for almost a thousand years. Um, and um, uh, they have a tour there, a private tour where they take you to tunnels that were dug in like the 1300s and they are smaller, like they're three feet wide, right? They're four feet wide and you have to crawl through them like you were a worm. So yeah, it was a lot of fun. So at the end of my, I, uh, at, after for a, maybe three years in Germany, I moved to Penn, where I still am now. And uh, I, Penn is just absolutely beautiful place to be. These are some pictures from Philadelphia and from Penn. But of course I had a deja vu because uh, this is the building I am now on the right. And this is the building I left from the undergraduate in Athens. And I have a terrible deja vu when I come to work. Uh, every day, but and my, my colleagues who are in the call and they know this building, they probably feel for me. Uh, now here it, uh, at UPenn, I continued doing essentially the same, uh, some of the same things that I was doing uh, in uh, my uh, MPI position, studying basically the vasculature in leaves, but also in many other vascular networks and doing my, a much broader set of problems, primarily uh, inspired, I would say, by um, the vasculature, right, in, uh, uh, in biology, but also any system where at the bare bones, you could describe it as a network, as a transport network, right? You were very interested uh, we were and we still are very interested in transport networks, and this could also be like a river. And uh, I know my almost out of time, right? This is my, this, I think this is my second to last slide. Um, I have to say, I really love the biology, but I'm going to go back to, uh, in a little bit of uh, tongue in cheek, I'm going to go back to what I told my PhD advisor that I don't want to, to do biophysics. Uh, deep down. Um, and what I am really fascinated uh, about is also the mathematics of it, like the uh, how biology in a way learns math. Um, and this is a cartoon for the XKCD, which kind of describes a little bit my, uh, my sentiment. So throughout this uh, trajectory, I got to work with an amazing amazing group of postdocs and students. And this is a subset of them. Unfortunately, we don't have a really big group picture, but this is uh, a subset of the people I work with. And I feel very, very lucky. Now, I know at the end of my talk, I'm supposed to give you some big wisdom, especially you know the younger people. I have no absolutely no wisdom 
to say, but one of my favorite quotes that describes uh, my life is, and I think a lot of us, a lot of academics, although we don't like to admit it, is a quote by Winston Churchill, uh, which is a success consists of going from failure to failure without loss of enthusiasm. And the people that go from grant rejection to grant rejection and, uh, you know, paper bad reviews from bad reviews and then still being extremely enthusiastic about where they do know exactly uh, what, how I feel. So with this, thank you very much. I will stop uh, my presentation and I'm sorry for going a little bit over. Uh, thank you for that very nice talk, Eleni. Uh, we do have time for one or two questions. If you have a question, just unmute and go for it. Audience. Okay, I, I will ask one while people think. Um, you were very sure you didn't want to be a mathematician and you didn't want to be a biologist. Um, and I'm really curious, what was it about physics that you saw yourself as a uh, possible physicist? Yeah, that is a very, that's a very good question. Um, physicists are a little bit uh, jack of all trades. You get to investigate nature. And if you want to do math, you do math. Uh, you go towards the math side without having the pressure to you know, prove theorems. Uh, and if you want to do something more engineering-like, you get to do something more engineering-like. It's a very, very general subject, and it allows you the flexibility to find your own niche exactly as you want it. Wonderful. Thank you. So on the note of um, Wanderers Unite in Physics, <laughs> uh, unless there are any other burning questions, I will... Thank Eleni again on behalf of the audience and close the recording.